I'm not going to take any more time. I just want to jump right into the words. If you remain standing, I'm going to go to Romans 8. I feel God speaking to me, and I believe the Lord has already met us here. Now, I want you to just continue that right there, what we just felt. You can tap into that any time during this service, and we'll join right in with you. Is that a deal? Thank you, Jesus. Romans 8, 28, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If he had it all figured out in advance, is what it's saying, then if he is for us, what if I told you COVID did not surprise God? What if I told you that the problems that we go through, now if you choose your own problems, if you create your own problems, that's you're receiving the recompense of your error, according to the Bible. But what if the problems that just you're doing everything you know to do, you're doing, you're living for him. You're not perfect, but you're living for God and things still happen. What if I told you that did not take God by surprise? Does that make him a mean, cruel God? The question is, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? It's not that way in the kingdom. God trusts his people with bad things so that he might be made manifest through them. Okay. I want to minister to you today, though, using this title, Stick to the Script. It's already written. It's already written. So when things don't work, when things go wrong, stick to the last thing he told you to do. Amen? Stretch forth your hands one more time. God, I glorify your mighty name. You are in this place. We are entertaining your presence and a holy host of angels that have come into this place with curiosity looking at a church that is praising you in spite of trouble. Lord, I'm honored to be here with your saints, oh God, your glorified ones. I pray that you would speak through me to your people, and I pray, Lord, that they would minister with me today, Jesus, as we minister together, one body pursuing your presence. In the name of Jesus, we glorify and honor your name. What you do today, God, you are not a monkey on a ball for us, Lord. Whatever you choose to do, we are perfectly fine with it. We're not going to tell you what to do. We're going to believe that you're going to do something, and we're going to thank you when you do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Give the Lord a hand clap. In Jesus' name, you may be seated. Thankful for you, Pastor, Sister Weedman, Brother Clark, Sister Amber. Love y'all. So thankful to be with my family today. We're related through the blood of Jesus, and there's no closer blood than those that have been baptized in the blood. Amen. At the end of 2007 and beginning of 2008, there was a strike held by the Writers Guild Association. This is the association comprised of screenwriters for Hollywood films. In their strike rules, they declared that all actors were prohibited from any improvisation, even casual minor adjustments to the script or dialogue made prior to the period of filming. In fact, Eileen Starger, who is the vice president of casting for Walt Disney, she says this about a script written by the writers, part of the Writers Association. She says that one can compare a script to a musical score. Just as a musician wouldn't deviate from the notes, actors shouldn't change words to suit their own way of saying things because you change the nature of what was written when you try to improv. Basically, these writers got tired of posh A-list actors saying they can do the script better by improving. So they went on strike and said, we will not write another script until these actors can learn to get in character with what was already written before they decided to change it. And I personally feel that this is a great way to read the Bible. The Bible is like a chained bulldog. I don't have to make apologies for it. All I have to do is let it off the leash. I don't have to infer my own ideas into this book. I can just let the Bible say what it wants to say and it's right. As long as I am representing it right and speaking it it's in its appropriate context, then the Bible just becomes the Bible. I don't have to apologize of it, but this is the thing. That is the only book on this planet that reads me. I don't read this book. I study this book and it reads me and it tells me how I'm supposed to live. And I have to let go of tradition, I have to let go of ideas, I have to let go of everything and just follow what the book says. And some things, sometimes when you read the Bible, will wreck your ideologies, but it leaves us in a position of, do I do what is written? That's what we have to adhere to. 
I cannot just choose to make it say what I want it to say. And this is a beautiful way to read the Bible. If you read it as a grand script by an amazing author, some things start popping off the pages. Genesis 1 starts with an unlimited budget, starts with a visionary, starts with a director, a writer, God Almighty. And God looked down and he said, it's not good. I don't want to be just God, Echad, God alone. So I'm going to make man so that I can be in a relationship with him. He looks at man and he says, it's not good that man should be alone. First thing in 52 verses that God says isn't good is when man's by himself. And God made man a wife the same way he would make himself a bride on Calvary. Because God doesn't like to be without us. Why keep us around if he didn't like us? It's not like we're good people, but he leaves us around. And we read that this unlimited budget was given to God, and God begins to write and build a master stage called Earth. He places marquee lights in the sky. He places a sun. He places a moon. And he doesn't have any budget whatsoever. He puts the, the stars into the sky. He puts the fish into the sea. He calls the, the daytime day. He calls the nighttime night. He gives everything an identity because God leaves nothing without a name. Amen. He spared no expense setting up props such as trees, grass, mountains. Even live animals were on the set of what he was writing. But God began to write his favorite part. He wrote mankind into the story. Once the lights were in position and everything was placed on set, this master writer slash director comes and stamps his image in mud. And he not only stamps an image, but he always feels what he formed. It's the way of God. In fact, when you read the Bible in Genesis and Hebrew, the Bible calls us a, a nephesh, which is, here, I'm just going to ruin your day. That's an animal. <laughs> we were created after the animals, the beast of the land, the Bible says. We were second born on day six. He created the animals first, and we were the second born. But to the second born, what did he do? The Bible says his spirit comes and hovers over the nephesh, and he breathes into the nephesh, his ruach, and he becomes a, a neshema, a spirit. We're the only animal on this planet that was filled with the presence of God. And the animals weren't too keen on this, the firstborns. And we got the identity of God. We got the dominion of God. We were told to have dominion over the animals that were created before us. And it was an animal that wasn't real happy about this. And the animal had us sell our birthright of dominion. That's what's taking place in the Bible. Then we get to later on in the Bible, he's still writing the script. And we see that a second born cheats his brother out of his birthright. And we're, we're being revealed in the Bible to there's hope for second born. Why is all this important? Well, Jesus shows up and he was the second Adam. And the Bible says in Mark that he goes into the wilderness towards the east. And what's he with? He's with the wild animals. Just randomly. And what God did is he was, he was tempted by Satan. And Satan tells him, he says, you know, if you'll bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. And notice what Jesus does not do. He does not correct them and say, those are my kingdoms. No, we sold the dominion of this world to the adversary. And Jesus said, but I'm going to get dominion back over you here. The word world was used in Mark. And then Jesus tells the disciples, he says, in this world, you're going to have some trouble. But be of good cheer, I overcame it. And I'm about to put the overcomer in you so that you too can overcome it and set your glory and your eyes towards the new world that is coming. We need to, and by the way, the, Hebrew, the Greek word for uh, flesh is sarx. It means animal-like behavior. Our flesh is our biggest problem. And we were told by God to have dominion over animals. I am called to have dominion over this flesh and entertain the spirit side of myself. You were created in a spiritual place. Ezekiel 28 says that Eden was a mountain. And that's where we were made as a holy mountain where the natural and the supernatural were one place. You were first and foremost a spiritual being. And because of flesh, we have carnal experiences. We do not have spiritual experiences and live carnal lives. We're trying to reverse that by having dominion over this animal. Making sense? He wrote all of this. It was written. He, he was slain at the foundations of the earth because he knew we'd be a bunch of animals. This is what he did. He factored our failure into the book. He said, they're going to fail me. They're going to sell their birthright. And when they do, I'm going to put on animal-like flesh. And I'm going to walk amongst them, and I'm going to get them back from their animal-like behavior. He wrote all of this into this glorious script. I tell people all the time, I read this book about nine hours a day, and I will just gladly tell you, 
I, can, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist anymore. Here's the thing is when you read this book, you have to agree with me. If God didn't write it, them rascals were smart. That's some smart dudes. I don't know how people from three different continents and I, don't, I can't even remember off the top of my head how many authors, how they all can be saying the same thing and never have met each other. You tell me. But if we go through the screenplay of the Bible, which he wrote, we're going to see that this brilliant one author through multiple people has employed different characters to live out the story of the Bible. He chose us to carry the story forward. He wanted an epic he said, I want a post-apocalyptic story. I, I had chaos at the beginning of earth through water, and I created creation out of that. Man has allowed chaos to come back, so I'm going to allow chaos to wipe them out. I'm going to send water yet again to deconstruct what I constructed. And he comes along, and he allows a flood, but he says, I'm going to write in a post-apocalyptic story here, and I need one person who's willing to stick to the script and not add or take away. Noah. Fun fact about Noah, Noah's name is Nuach in Hebrew, which means rest, and his father prophesied about him at 777 years old. The Bible's insane, man. Just read it. It blows me away. A man who was 777 years old prophesied, and he said, the Lord's going to send us rest, so I'm going to name this guy Noah, which means rest. The Bible's just cool. He's going forward through the Bible, and he says, you know what? I want someone who's willing to leave their home, their family, security, this guy who lives in Ur of the Chaldees, which is the, the pinnacle of society of that day and time. It's where the written word came from, poetry, the will, they believe came out of Ur. And that's where Abram and Sarah live. Sarah's barren there. She wants children, but she can't have some. And God comes and says, I want you to leave everything that's comfortable. Forsake it all. Let it go. Go and live in tents. And lo and behold, Sarah gives birth to a baby in a tent, but she didn't give birth to a baby in comfort. There's things you can only birth when you stick to what was written. God had it pre-written for her, and when she walked into it, she got something birthed through her by just following the voice of God. Abram became a father of many nations. God called that story the Godfather of many nations. That was the name of that story. This master screenwriter has cast the elderly. He cast teenagers. He's cast men, women, harlots, outsiders, no-name actors, high-profile name actors. In his story, even the seemingly insignificant held large roles. Abigail in the Bible, you may not know who she is, you might, but she didn't have very many lines in the grand scheme of the whole book. She had just a few lines given to her by God. But when you read what she did by following the script, she intercepted King David when David was angry at her belligerent husband. And God used her to preserve the sanctity of the southern kingdom for David because if David would have killed her husband, before she stopped him, David would not have been able to clutch Judah. Here we are. God is putting all these people into place. There are prophets in the Bible. We don't even know their names. In the end credits of the film, we don't even see their names because it was about one author. All of this he allows us as characters, and we are, we are the sub-characters, uh, sub and God is the main character. Everything was pointing to him. We would love to be David, wouldn't we? I would be, I'm David, I'm the one who kills giants. No, we're the ones hiding up on a mountain scared to death. Jesus is the one who kills giants. We, this is what we try to infer ourselves into the text. When we carry the story forward, the story's still about him. All of this led to him. Before any of these people I just mentioned, though, before the, any of them had a story, before they had a script, a role, God already had it written what he was going to use them for. Pull up for me Psalm 139. Look at this. You see, you don't think I'm nuts. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it right well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. That word substance is the Hebrew word golem. It means embryo. You saw me as an embryo. In your book, listen to this, were written. Every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Before you had a body, you had a book. I'm going to say that again. Before you had a soul, you had a script. God had all your days fashioned for you, long before you were ever born. God has a library in heaven of people that he has pre-written. So I just want to introduce this to you for a moment. God looked at 2020. And he said, I'm going to allow some things in America that are going to be difficult. 
and he looked way back before you were born, and he looked through his library, and he had a host of elders around him. The Bible calls them the 24 elders, and he looks, and he has a council according to the Old Testament, and he looks at those books, and he says, who can I trust with the end times? I want to help you today. I'm not even going to get real preachy. I'm not going to move real fast. God Almighty, who never writes anything bad, looks through that vast library of his, and he comes and he says, I'm going to choose you. He pulls your book out of the shelf. He tosses it into the earth. He said, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose you. I'm going to choose you. Who can I trust? Who's, who's here that I can trust? I'm going to choose you, you, you. And he starts pulling all these books, and he's walking with an entire library, and he tosses them into the earth, and he says, I can trust them with trouble. He chose you for a pandemic. He chose you, the church of 2020, for the problems that the earth would face today. And he said, nobody else will do for 2020, only this group. If we, we're preaching a lot, the end times, aren't we? You've probably heard this is the last hours. Great, I'm going to keep on preaching that. I believe that. But do you realize Ecclesiastes 4 said the end of a thing is better than its beginning? Look what Jesus wrote. Look what the author of Matthew wrote. He wrote in Matthew, he wrote the first miracle. This is the only place you'll find the miracle at Canaan is in Matthew, right? He's writing the miracle of Canaan. And what did Jesus do? Anybody a little pop trivia here? Turn water to wine, right? And then the governor takes that wine and he drinks it and he says, Oh, you saved the best for last. And so we're introduced to a God who does good things or better things last. And the last thing he did was turn water to wine. And then Matthew also, he's the one who highlighted, he's the only one who highlighted this when Jesus is on a cross. Jesus said, hey, dip that sponge in the wine and put it to my lips. Jesus drinks wine and out of his rib comes water. You following? His first miracle, he turned water to wine and he removed shame from a bride. Mm. His last miracle, he's doing it better. He turns wine to water and removes shame from us, his bride. He always does something last. When he does something last, he's doing it better than whatever he's done before. We should have the same expectations now. Uh, you need to have more confidence in your Holy Ghost. We should be as a church, we should have more confidence in ourselves that God, you wrote a real good epic with Paul, but you did that way back in Acts. That was 70 AD around that time. What are you going to do in 2020? If this is the last generation... All the lump, I believe this, I believe that he pulled a lump of clay out of heaven and it was the last lump of clay and that was humanity and he started to form it and he took all the experience of Peter, James, John, Paul, Ezekiel, Elijah, all of those people and he said, I've been doing this a long time and this is my last lump of clay that I'm going to form mankind with and all the experience from all those people I'm putting into this last lump. There's no way this end time church can fail. There should be no excuse for us because all of the experience of that great God who did all that with those other scripts, he's writing the best now. Let me just, let me show it to you so you don't think I'm crazy. Jeremiah 1, I'm just going to keep on doing this because I, I don't want you to think I'm nuts. Now the word of the Lord came to me, this is Jeremiah, saying before I formed you in the womb, what? I knew you. That word knew in Hebrew is an intimacy. He's like, I was already intimate with you before you were even human. I was intimate with you. I knew your embryo. I, I saw you. And what I went, when I was looking through the books, I saw Jeremiah and I said, oh, yes, I want that one. And he began to embrace that book, that story of Jeremiah. And he says, I separated you from all the other books because I needed a prophet for the nations. So I separated this book from all the rest. That word right there, consecrated, he said, I separated you from everybody else. Not because you're better, but because I've written you differently. Doesn't make all these other stories insignificant and you more important. You're just a different book than they are. This is why we don't compare ourselves amongst ourselves because you're not the same book I am. You can't do the things I can do and I can't do the things you can do. You, and I tell people, it's like, you can't preach like me. I wouldn't want you to. This world needs me in it, and it needs you in it. Don't preach like anybody else. Don't evangelize like anybody else. Don't pray like anybody else. Pray the way God wrote you to do it. Because what we need in this end time hour is church people, sanctified people, who are saying, God, you made me wonderful. You made me perfect. You knew it right well. You saw me. You separated me. Let me do what you've called me to do. And he's doing this with Jeremiah. He said, I appointed you. 
He comes with a pre-written script and he says, Jeremiah, it's already written. I just need you to get in character. Don't change what's written. Don't try to change yourself. Don't try to model yourself after all these other Israelites. You need to be what I have written. Stick to the script. Don't be a posh A-list actor thinking you're all important because you're a prophet. Just do what I wrote. And Jeremiah comes like we do with a bunch of insecurities. Verse 6, he said, then I said, oh, ah, oh. This is, one, this is how I approach God sometimes. Ah, oh, Lord, you want me to say that? Behold, I don't know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. Due to insecurities, Jeremiah negotiates about the role that was written of him. But God knew he was the perfect fit, and he says this in verse 7. Do not say, I am only a youth, for all to whom I send you, you shall go. And who, whatever I command you, you shall speak. My favorite scripture that everybody I feel like messes up and it's all on calendars and memes and it's taken way out of context is Jeremiah 29, 11. For the Lord has thoughts towards you, thoughts of peace, not to be able to give you what? An expected end. They were slaves when, when God said that to them. They were, in a, they were in deep trouble. And God shows up and tells through Jeremiah, says, I have thoughts of you, thoughts of peace. And they're like, well, that's great. Look at us. We're not in, we're not, this isn't peaceful. We just see it on a calendar and on a meme and we think that, you know, I'm going to use that scripture next time, you know, I want that new motorcycle doesn't work that way <laughs> I tried it when you read it in context I was like oh man that's they're in, they're in problems but it says I have thoughts towards you okay where you are now is not where you're ending the end of a thing is better than its beginning I need you to get through where you are now to the ending and I need you to stick to the script to get there huh. if you can hear me this was the context of Jeremiah Guys, if you can make it through this slavery, if you can make it through this persecution and you get on the other side, you won't persecute people anymore. That's the context of what's going on. God was saying, how do I get, because Israel was persecuting people. Read, read your Bibles under the, the leadership of Solomon. They were starting to be cruel to people and God was like, how do I get that out of my people? Oh, I know. I'll write into their script that they will be persecuted. And empathy was developed in Israel. And God was like, I'm doing this for your own good. I chasten whom I love. If you can get through this, you'll be a better version of what I wrote you to be. I just need you to stick to the script. Don't leave me. I haven't left you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I just ask you to do the same for me. Amen? Stick to the script, Jeremiah. It's all written. Sometimes even screenwriters, directors, they enter their visions, kind of like Stan Lee. They have a cameo role in their vision. Hebrews 10, look where it says about Jesus. This is speaking of Jesus in Hebrews 10. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, what? In the volume of the books written of me. To what? This is what was written of Jesus. Jesus came as a book, walking amongst books, and he said, my whole purpose in being here is to do the will of my Father. That's my whole point. That's what this book is all about, is to not do what I want to do, but to do what is written. I don't get to deviate from the script. And when you read Revelation, what do you see? You see John in heaven, and he looks and he says, behold, a scroll sealed with seven seals, and I saw no one worthy to open it. And John hits his knees and begins to weep, and the angel says, no, get up, behold the Lamb. There was a book that only Jesus could live. None of us could do what he did. And Jesus said, I'm coming to do what no other man, woman, nobody else, there was no prophet can do this, and I'm going to do what nobody else could do. Adam couldn't do it, but the second Adam can do it. He lost, he lost our authority to the flesh, but I'm going to get it all back. He put us into exile, I'm going to get us to redemption. Jesus came and lived a story in a book. That Aren't you thankful that Jesus didn't deviate from the script? Aren't you thankful that Jesus said, oh, if it be possible, I would love to live any other role. But however, I want to do the will of God. I want to do what he's written for me to do. Aren't you thankful that Jesus stuck to it? But here's the thing. In 2020, the weight of the world is still on the church and relying on us to do what is written. Jesus is still here through us. We're the body of Christ, and he is waiting on somebody to say, you have given me a body and you have written for me a script not to do what I want to do, but to do what you have called me to do. The greatest death you will ever die today will be the death to yourself. Do you know where Jesus died? Wasn't on a cross. He died in a garden. 
And we found his body hanging from a cross. But Jesus died in the garden when he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And Jesus died right there to his flesh. And we just saw the remains of him hanging on that cross. When we can truly die, that's when we'll be the church God has designed us to be. I'm getting all over my notes right now, but I don't care. Right after the, the greatest loss of our lives, my, my, I was driving home from work one day, and I was driving down uh, East Broussard, which makes no sense because it says E. Broussard, but it doesn't even mean East, so I don't, even, I don't know what it means in, in Lafayette. It's E. Broussard. I think it's East, but they tell me it's not. Anyway, I was driving down East Broussard. I just had an AD moment, sorry. I was driving down East E. Broussard, and as I was driving, I began to just, I got frustrated with God. I can't even say I was praying. I was mostly angry. And I was just telling God, I said, God, I wish you to let me die. Because you see, I was about two months removed from the worst day of my wife and I's life. Our house burned down. Our three-year-old son got trapped in the house. And we were completely in ruins, my wife and I. And I was driving and I just began to get frustrated with God. And I said, God, I said, I really wish you to let me die in that house that day. I said, I don't even feel like a man. I feel like that I have, I, I failed my wife. I feel like I failed my family. I said, I'm even, my pride is taken. Like, I'm a little embarrassed because, you know, I had a bunch of people telling me, why didn't you save your son? I had people telling me that junk. I had people telling me, like, why didn't you run back into the house? And I said, I tried. What do you, I mean, come on, it was, the house was on fire. And so I'm sitting here embarrassed, my pride taking a lick, Brother Wheatner, and I was driving, and I said, God, I wish you to just let me die. I'm just going to be honest with you. And this is what God spoke to me. He said, Aaron, he said, I did let you die. And he asked me three questions. He said, do you care about preaching engagements anymore? I said, Lord, I couldn't care less. I said, I want to continue ministry, but I don't care about preaching. He said, do you care about what people think of you? I said, Lord, I don't, I don't care what anybody thinks of me. I've always been a little odd. It don't matter to me. And he said, well, do you care about stuff? I said, Lord, I lost everything I had in a house. And I've seen how fast stuff can leave this planet. It took seven minutes for my house to be completely gone. I lost everything that I thought was valuable in seven minutes. It's wild. And this is what God told me. He said, then Aaron, you have died the death that I've called all of my people to die to. And I began to weep. And I said, God, what will it take? He said, I will send persecution to the earth. He said, it will come in the next three years. He said, in the next three years, he said, I'm going to detach the ones who really want me from their stuff and from the things they think is important because I want a church that's willing to die. I've never told anybody this because I don't want anybody to freak out and think that, oh my goodness, I'm going to lose stuff like he did. I'm not telling you you're going to go through what I went through. But you, can, you have to admit right now it feels a little like we're losing things, don't it? What God is trying to do is he's trying to grab your attention and say, none of that matters. Focus on what matters. And I have faith that you will because you just did before I started preaching. You already did it. What you just exercised a moment ago is the lifestyle we were designed to live. Let's get our focus back on the script. Our script was to die. In fact, I'm just going to skip all my notes because I'm feeling this in the Holy Ghost. The, earlier this year, I was praying and I was fasting. And I was trying to ask God, what do you want me to do? If you want me to keep evangelizing, I'll keep evangelizing. But what else do you want me to do? What have you called me to do? And I do this every year because I don't want to get out of the will of God. And in prayer, I was seeking God. And this is why I had one of the clearest visions I've ever had in my life. I watched as I was in heaven, Brother Wiedner. I was standing on God's shoulder. He was a giant. And I saw him. There was a desk in front of him. Clearest vision I've ever had. And I watched God. He took a book out of that top shelf. And I saw my name written on the spine of it. I could see clear as day, Aaron Holloway. And he took that book and he put it down on a big desk. And he started writing things. He started writing when he would call me into ministry. He said, I have called. I have separated him. I have watched him. I have designed him for a specific role, a specific purpose, and a specific time. I'm going to give him his first sermon at the age of five, standing in front of his father's church in Simsport, Louisiana. He's going to grow, striving to be a minister, but I'm going to allow him to see a church split where the church people get mad at his parents because they don't choose sides. He's going to be home one night where the angry church people egg their house and slice all the tires on their car, and I'm going to see him get bitter towards ministry and run from it till the age of 19. Then at the age of 19, I'm going to call him to go to Florida where he thinks he's going to meet girls, but when he gets there, I'm going to have him baptize eight gang members in a water fountain, and it's going to change his life for eternity and I can already hear his prayers now God if you'll let me do this in ministry then I will do ministry if you'll let me baptize people and reach the lost then I'm going to introduce him at a youth rally to his wife and I'm going to merge two books 
into one. And then I'm going to trust them with a beautiful baby book named Levi. And I'm going to give him a dark season of chapters that he cannot reverse. And that book's going to come back to heaven and it's going to wait on him and his wife. But I'm going to give him other children because I trust that family with books. And I saw him writing. And then Brother Wiener, I saw him. He skipped a huge portion of the books and he went to the back and he wrote, Aaron is destined for heaven. And I watched him. He shut that book. I could see tear stains all over the book because the Lord is intimate with what he writes. In the clearest vision I've ever had, I saw him. He took a leather strap, put it over the top. He poured hot wax on that strap, and he sealed it shut. And he grabbed that book, and he embraced it. I could see it as clear as day. I can still see it right now. I'm telling you what has changed my life. I watched him. He nurtured this book, and he walked to the edge of the balcony of heaven, and he tossed it over the edge, and I saw my mother on her knees praying. And I could see that little Spanish lady. She was in travail and she said, Lord, give me a prophet to the nations. Give me somebody and I will consecrate him. And Lord, I will raise him up in truth. And I saw her catch that book because the Lord trusts us as parents with books. Your job is important, parents. You better make sure that you understand what you're doing. God trusted you with a story he was intimate with first, and you got the book second. And she had that book, and she handed it to me. And I watched myself. I took that leather strap, and I tore that wax seal open, and I went to page one. And the vision ended, and this is what God told me in prayer that day. He said, Aaron, he said, for those whom I did foreknow, then did I predestine to be conformed to the image of me. He said, and every single person on this planet, all seven billion of them, he said, they have had a book before they had a body. They had a script before they had a soul. And he said, all of them I have seen, I have called, I have separated. He said, and every single one of them are destined for heaven, but not not all are coming. And I began to weep in prayer, and I entered into travail for a moment. And I said, God, I said, why? Why can't everybody just do what is written? He said, it has everything to do with that wax seal on the top. I said, Lord, what was that wax seal? He said, that is your will. He said, it's not until you can break your will can I finish what I have authored. I'm going to say that again. It's not until you can break that will of yours can God be the author and the finisher. (laughs) Hear me right now. God needs the church to die. God needs each of us to come. And this is what Peter was saying. He said, all of you have been living your own ways. Our Lord and Savior was hung on a cross because you were doing things the way you wanted to. Even though he planned it that way, you didn't have to be the ones crying out Barabbas. And they looked at him and they said, Lord, what must we do? And he says, you need to die. How do we die? Do you realize that the only thing that you have ever been given is your choice? That's really the only thing you own. You don't own that house. You don't own that car. Those kids aren't yours. That spouse isn't yours. The only thing you really have is to say yes or no. That's all you have. And that's why in the Bible, when you study Hebrew culture, the bride, she was to give one thing away. It was the only thing she had. It was her dowry given to her by her father. And when she wanted to enter into a relationship with a husband, she had to give her dowry to her husband-to-be. But it wasn't that big of a sacrifice because if she married the husband, she got everything he had. So when we come to an altar and we hit our knees and we say, God, I'm not picking colleges. I'm not going to make my own mind. I'm not going to pick my spouse. I'm not going to pick my career. Lord, I'm going to seek your will first and foremost. That's called repentance. That's where we come and die. And that's when God says, okay, you've given me the pen. And now I'm going to fill you with my spirit. That is what is written of all of us. Why do you think the Bible says hell enlarges itself daily? None of us were designed for that. Hell was made for the devil and one third of the angels. Hell has to make home improvements daily because of will. We are in a position to be the most profound church that this world has ever seen. But it's entirely up to us if we're going to be it. God had a script. I'm coming to a close. Listen to this. John 19. Jesus goes up on the cross and he says, this book's done. It's finished. Here's, I'm putting a period on this book. I've done what I'm supposed to do. I raised up 12, and I'm about to put my spirit in 120, and I'm going to put it in 3,000. I'm going to put it in every whosoever will, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I'm going to keep filling people with this because I'm going to stay here. I'm not leaving. Part of me is going up. Part of me is staying here. He's put his spirit in the church. But before he said it is finished, 
He said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, thy will be done. We cannot say it is finished until we say not my will. Pages don't even turn. Some of us say, God, how come nothing's changing in my life? How come nothing's moving? It's because we're not changing and we're not moving. When we truly die and we say, God, not my will, pages turn. Let me just tell you a little bit of my life. It's stressful being an evangelist. Just like any other ministry. Just like any other job. I don't know where I'm going to go next week. But January, God healed me of stress. He healed me of anxiety. Because when he showed me that vision, this is what he told me. He said, Aaron, I called you to evangelize. That means I'll take you wherever I want to take you. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. Just, just say what I tell you to say. And I'll bring you to the places where I need you to say it. I haven't had to pick up the phone in two years. Not because I'm a good preacher, but because I have a good booking agent. Thank you for your applause, but God, I don't, hear me. My finances, God takes care of. During pandemic, I had church people all around the U.S. just saying, hey, had you on my heart, send me finances. I don't have to stress about anything because I know what is written. Well, Brother Aaron, you lost your son. Yeah, but I get him back. So what if I can get his glory here and I can get his glory there with my son? Does that, I would love to have my son here. Yes, don't ever get that twisted. I think about that little boy every day. But I also have a wife. I have a daughter. I have a son. And God is preparing heaven for me. But I'll never get to see any of that unless I can do what is written now. So I'm asking you the question, and I'm going to leave it with your soul, because only you can give God the pen. What has been written? I'll tell you this much. Something is written, but it's entirely up to you if he's going to finish it. He cannot say it is finished until he hears us say, not my will. Your story will just stay locked where it's at until you can truly die. So this is my recommendation humbly to you. Wherever you are, I want you to not worry about who's looking at you, where, who's sitting next to you, what's going on after. I want you to truly die right now. God, I'm not worried about making up my own decisions. I'm not worried about making things happen. I'm not going to push doors open. I'm not going to try and force things. God, I'm going to die right now. I implore you to do that. With if, However you want to pray, if you want to run to these altars and you want to do it, that would be a great sign of faith. If you want to hit your knees right now and do it, I'm not asking for anything extravagant. I have no expectations on God. I'm just doing what he told me to say right now. I just am imploring you, whoever wants to, instead of before you can come and die, you have to come and die. So I'm asking you, die to self right now. God, I'm not going to stress about finances. I'm not going to be fearful. I'm not going to worry. Here's why. It is already written. COVID was written long ago. And God said, I got a whole group of people I'm going to trust with COVID-19. He said, I'm gonna, I've got a whole group of people I'm going to trust with social injustice. Here we are. This is what God's waiting on. Here I am, Lord, send me. So right now, begin to pray that. I want you to lock into what you tapped into earlier. And I want you to enter into that presence of God. Clear your mind and just say, God, here I am. Send me. Send me. Send me. Lord, whatever you need me to do in this church, I'm going to do it. Whatever you need me to do in this area of ball, I'm going to do it. Whatever you're calling me to do in my family, Lord, here I am. Send me. Send me. Go ahead and pray that prayer. Lift up your voice. <laughs> it is already written. It's already written. Well, there's a book of Briar already written. There's a book of Shelby. It's already written. It's already done. And here's what I know about the Bible. He does nothing bad. He writes good ones every single time. He's just waiting on somebody to say, God, here's the book you wrote. Take control of it. So come on. He is script. Here we are. We're in the neat part of every church service. I love this part of preaching. We're in the unscripted part. What happens next depends on you, not me. If there's a deep move of God in here, it's because you wanted it. If there's callings and elections in this place, it's because you reached out for him and got him. 
So right now, with everything you've got, lift up your hands, lift up your voice, begin to praise Him. Begin to push into the Spirit. Reach for everything He's got for you. Reach into the next paragraph and grab that sentence. Reach into the next chapter of your life and grab that chapter. You, There's probably somebody in this room right now who God has put the cure of COVID into your soul and He's put the anointing in you to go and lay hands on people. He's probably put that in you. But we'll never know unless we start stepping into it. God has put the answers to our world into His people and He's waiting on people to just start walking in what has been written. Walk in it, saint of God. Walk in it, man of God. Walk in it, woman of God. God has trusted you and proved that you can be trusted in this hour. So let Him know. God, thank you for trusting me. Here I am. Lord, here's your people. Here's the greatest church that you have ever had. Here's the greatest hour that's ever been. Here's the people that you've trusted for now. Here they are, God. Look at them. They're presenting themselves unto you. We're offering our body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto you. For this is our reasonable service. Here we are, God. Here's the greatest church that's ever walked the earth. Here we are, Lord. Use us. Anoint us. Lord, fill us. Put the answers in us. Lord, put the anointing in us. Put the healing in us. Put the word in us. But Lord, more than anything, apostolic us. Send us out into this world. Lord, let us bring peace everywhere we go. Lord, don't let our feet be swift to mischief, but let our feet be shodden with the preparation of gospel of peace. Lord, don't let these hands strike anyone, but let them be holy and let them lift it up towards you, Jesus. Here's your people. Pray that right now, Lord. Here I am. Use me. Use me. Oh, the presence of God is here because wherever there's a sacrifice, there's always an altar of incense. And when there's an altar of incense, there's always something rising up before God. What you're doing right now is rising to heaven. Come on. There's a holy smoke rising towards heaven right now. He can smell. It's a sweet-smelling nostril. To his sweet-smelling savor to his nostrils. And that's the sacrifice of his people. When somebody says, you're not doing it my way anymore. Oh, it rises to heaven. Heaven is being filled with the Holy Smoke. Now offer him that praise. Go ahead, lift up your voice. God loves that voice of yours.